All right, guys, thanks everyone for um, for coming on, um, for your time. Sean, thanks ever so much for agreeing to do this, mate. We really appreciate it. We know you're a busy man and it's, this is international break. So it was technically a weekend off and at half 11 you're doing this. So we do really, really appreciate it. Thank you, mate. No problem. Um, I think you agree. The promotional stuff I put out, I'm, I put your best picture. I made a good picture for you out there, okay? Um, so I've looked after you there. Um, for, I guess before we go into anything, Neza, will you just do a favour for the group and will you just spend a couple of minutes talking about your background, how it started, that kind of thing, and your career, if that's all right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, thanks for having us on. And um, hello to everyone on the on the call. It's, um, it's brilliant to see so many people that have, um, that have joined in this, um, hopefully, what's going to be a, a good question and answers. So um, my background... Um, started at my hometown club in Nottingham, which is um, a small football club in Nottingham called Notts County. There's two clubs there, Nottingham Forest and Notts County. And I played for the smaller club there, started on my 10th birthday. Um, played all the way through until I was 20 years old. So I went all the way through the junior sides. How do you do that? And suddenly um, at the end of, um, I think I was 20 years old, I got sold to another football club called Sheffield United. And so my journey started. Um, and I think, you know, uh, all the way until I was 35, I played for Sheffield United, um, Portsmouth, Crystal Palace twice, Leeds United, Nottingham Forest on loan, QPR. Um, so there's a number of clubs in there that I've represented. Um, played 652 senior appearances. And of course, at the end of my playing contract, um, when it all came to an end, finished when I was 35 and suddenly ended up back in Nottingham as a 35-year-old as a manager, managing my hometown club in what is now, um, well, what was then Football League One. And unfortunately, since then days, you know, the football club's fallen out of the football pyramid into the, into the conference. But it was my hometown club. And it was one that I spent 10 years there as a, as a young player. So um, I suppose that's a brief um, kind of overview of my young career. Thanks, mate. That's a very um, modest, you said. You know, like there's, uh, you know, just to put it into context, how many Premier League games did you play? There's a... All in all, I played, I think, 62. 62 okay. Premier League games. The majority of my um, games were played in the Championship. But, of course, yeah, fortunate to play Premier League football, which, which was brilliant. Um, OK, so I guess the most people on this call, some of the, I guess, the, the regular kind of questions are, um, were you always going to be a footballer? Uh, were you always going to be a soccer player? Were you, you know, were you always the talented kid? Or what was your journey? Were, you know, any different... Well, yeah, of course, like everyone, you have a dream, don't you? You know, I, I, I can't remember a time when I didn't have a ball at my feet. Um, my, my parents will say that I was born with a, with a ball, just like you guys are, I'm sure, over in the States. It's um, just, it was a dream for me. It was a dream that became a wonderful reality. Um, I remember actually a careers, um, a, a, a careers, conversation I had and it was it, it was my careers teacher saying so Sean what are you going to be and I said I'm going to be a professional footballer and I said no no seriously what are you going to be I said I'm going to be a professional footballer you know this is this is my dream this is what I want to be I was 14 years old and I got in trouble at school the school the school teacher actually rang my mum and dad up and said look this guy's not taking it serious but I was so serious I was super serious with the um you know, with my with my journey, with my beliefs, with my with, with my dream, and, uh, and thankfully it came true. Yeah, I think that's uh, obviously a really um, valuable lesson for for everyone there, because obviously everyone on this call has got aspirations of being a professional soccer player and playing to the highest you know level that they can. So you know, it's good to hear because obviously some people are you know my story is a bit different, and we've been through that, but. I wasn't like necessarily the best player. Some people obviously really were. So in terms of, were you the best player at school, for example? Were you the, or was it very much a case of you would just done, you know, whatever you needed to do, you would have done? Well, at school, 
I probably was, you know, I was probably one of the gifted players. Um, there was a number of guys at my school who, you know, uh, loved football and we had a good school team. I had a wonderful school teacher. It was absolutely brilliant, very supportive. Um, and it was actually my school teacher who put me into Notts, Notts County. He knew one of the um, one of the scouts there and he asked one of the scouts to come and watch me for school. I was a 10 year old playing, just starting off, just kicking a ball around and kind of wondering what, what this game was all about. And I was, you know, I, I must have shown something to be invited into Notts County. But once I went into that football club, very quickly I realised that I was just one of many young players who had this dream and, and who had this level of ability, so to speak. And there was 20 young players there and it was very, very difficult to kind of be one of the better ones because there was some really, really good young footballers there. And along the, you know, along that journey, along that way, there was some disappointment as well. I remember some weekends where I wasn't picked to play in, in, in the match game on a, on a Sunday. So I'd train on a Monday and a, and a Thursday night. And on a Sunday, unfortunately, I was left out of that squad to play. And I found that very difficult. I really did, as, especially as a young player. I think as a senior player, when I got a little bit older and I was being left out of one or two squads, I kind of understood it a little bit more, but, but not as a kid. It was very difficult. Yeah, and that's interesting. Something we've never really touched on because a lot of people, especially on this call as well, they used to being the best players in their team, you know, at the higher end of, of the quality. And like you said, the higher the, the level that you play, you are going to find a plateau, aren't you, as such, where, and it, it depends on how that individual reacts to that situation. Um, so, yeah. Um, so in terms of like making that tr transition there, so you've obviously gone into the youth setup and that. Um, do you remember your first chance in the first team? Do you remember how that came about? And Yeah, I mean, I went all the way through the youth setup from 10 to 16 and then, just hold fire. I don't know if you can hear that noise behind, but my dog's making an almighty <laughs> noise to try and get out of the kitchen. So I'll be 15 seconds, guys. Otherwise, I'm, you might have another added guest. <laughs> Here we are, back in the game. Um, yeah, so, you know, from, from 10 to 16, of course, you know, you're on that journey. You're hoping and dreaming that at 16 years old, the club give you the contract and my first contract did arrive at 16. Um, it was a, it was a very, very low paid contract, loads of hours, um, jobs as well as playing football. So my job was to um, clean the boots for the players and to, um, to clean the stands after, after the match day and so many other jobs along the way. And I was 17 when I um, got invited to, joined the first team for training, which was a which was a brilliant day. I remember coming home and telling my mum and dad that I'd, I'd trained with the first team. And my dad, who's a big Notts County fan, so he was a huge fan anyway. You know, his son was playing for the first team or training for the first team. So he was delighted. Um, and, and it was just a training session. And it, I, I remember it really well. It was a Tuesday. And then I got invited again to come and train with them on the Thursday. Um, and, and then I didn't go back to the first team for about, for about six months. I was kind of put back into the youth team, which I found really difficult because obviously as a 17-year-old as a at the time, I thought my chance is here. And it actually wasn't. I was just there to kind of supplement the numbers. Um, but fast forward six months, seven months later, I eventually did make my first team debut as a second year scholar um, at 18 years old. So um, it was a brilliant, brilliant occasion. Tuesday night, um, not many fans there. I think probably two, maybe 3,000 fans at Meadow Lane, which was the stadium. But I, it was the best day of my life to make my first team debut. It was wonderful. Okay, mate. Uh, so you've made your debut. Um, is it at that stage, you, you know, because a lot of people go to the phase of, Oh, I've made it now. You know, did you go through a stage where you got into the first team and you had a negative effect in terms of like, because often you have to go back to the reserves then and it, you can mentally can be tough on that. Or do you think, well, this is the start and I've got to dig deep and, and kick on from here? Well, I found it to be a, um, a pivotal moment in my, in my young career. My first team debut was something that I didn't want it to just 
come, stay, and never revisit it again. And um, my, my, my dad in particular, um, my biggest, biggest fan, but my harshest critic as well. You know, I, I remember coming home and my dad pulled the game apart, really, really scrutinised my um, performance. Um, I didn't need the manager to tell me the good and the bad and the, uh, and the indifferent things of the performance. It, it was my dad for about an hour after the game, come back at night, 10 o'clock at night, and we were sat in the kitchen and he was telling me, don't you dare just let this be your one and only time as a, as a first team player. You know, he, he really put it on me to, to make sure that the next day that I was training, that my performance level and my attitude and application leading into that training session allowed me to then be invited for the next squad. And that's what happened. You know, I, thankfully, I never looked back from that. I played for the remainder of that season and played, I think, from March to the end of the season, culminating in a in a playoff final, which was which was brilliant as a young 18-year-old. But look, my my mum and dad, they brilliant supporters of me, really backed me massively, but told me the truth as well, which was sometimes harsh. Yeah, and important. Yeah, very much so. Um, so I'm I'm looking. One thing we've never asked a, a player or coach really is, I, I've seen here like some huge clubs, which I know anyway. Um, you know that you're at Sheffield United, Leeds, um, QPR, Crystal Palace, etc. What do you want to tell everyone what it's like when you get a move? So when you get that first transfer, and I don't know what your, your cost was when you went to Sheffield United, but how? Could you just explain to everybody how that in the European market, what that? Because um, it's obviously very different to the just being traded over here. Do you know what I mean? So there's a lot of similarities, but a lot of differences as well. Yeah, I mean, well. It's I suppose to summarise the weekend, I played on the Saturday. Um, we won 5-3, played, played well. And then I went out on the Saturday night, um, socialised with a few friends. And then on the Sunday morning, bearing in mind, you know, these things weren't right. The, these mobile phones weren't around when I was, um, well, they were, but not, 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 as, not as smart as these. So my house phone my house phone rang and it was nine o'clock in the morning and it was the owner of the football club who'd let me know that the club had accepted a fee for me. Um, and I didn't have a say. I did I want to go and play at a high level? Of course I did. I wanted to play as high as I possibly could, but I didn't, I didn't really feel I was ready to leave home at that particular moment, but the club had sold me. I was sold. Um, the deal had been done on the Saturday night and I didn't have a say in it. But the chairman rang me, he said, listen, we've sold you. And I went for um, three quarters of a million pound, which for the level I was playing at, and at the times that I was playing, it was quite a lot of money for a young player. And I arrived up in Sheffield at 1.30 that afternoon. And my deal was done at two o'clock in the afternoon. And I trained on the Monday morning for my new football club. So I didn't have time to say goodbye to my teammates. I didn't have time to kind of make the transition um, from living from Nottingham to, to Sheffield. Uh, I literally went to Sheffield, stayed in a hotel that night and lived in the rest for the rest of that season in the hotel, which was probably an hour and 20 minutes away from home, which I've been since I was a kid. So it was tough and it took a little bit of time to, um, to find my feet. So your first move really actually was, ironically, an American trade almost. You know, you are being told. Um, whereas, obviously, subsequently you have moves where I guess you chose to, you know, and had the decision. Um, so you played, uh, I don't know if many of the guys know it, but he's been in the news recently. I know you played for um, Neil Warnock. Um, I would just like to, some of the boys and girls in this call to know what it's like to play for somebody like that. You know, what makes him tick, what he demands of his players. Because obviously, Ronaldo has been a, quite an eccentric at times, quite an eccentric person, isn't he? So just wonder what that was like, that experience. Well, I actually played for Neil Warnock um, three times. I played, he was, the, he was the man who sold me from Sheffield United to Portsmouth. So he sold me and he signed me twice at two different clubs. So, and I think I played 652 times and I must have played probably 250 times under that manager. Yeah. So a large part of my career was spent 
you know, playing for that particular person. Very experienced, um, incredibly um, honest with his demands. Tough, uncompromising, fair, um, creative in the way that he would make his players um, obviously play for him. So, and I use the expression creative. It's um, He knew that for me, he could tell me exactly what his demands were, but perhaps for somebody who was a different character and personality to me, he would put his arm around them and kind of cajole them in a different way. And I look at that creativity as a real... Um, real positive and a plus in the way that he manages people. But in terms of his style of play, um, it was very consistent. Uh, we, he wanted us to get the ball from a defensive area into an attacking area pretty quickly. And he expected us in the attacking third to be creative with a balance behind the ball. And because I was a holding midfielder, I had a large responsibility on my shoulders that I needed to be one of them guys who could control the defensive um, side of the game. Okay, mate. Um, obviously, he's just broken records this week. I mentioned him because some of the boys and girls may have seen, you know, the last couple of weeks, he, I think he broke the record in 1,600 games or, or something managed, so the, the, a world record. Um, so it was just interesting to hear that. Um, just a couple of other questions on the playing before we go on to managing. A lot of the boys and girls in here will know Leeds United, of course. Um, possibly don't know actually how big a club that is. What was that experience like going there? And how big, I guess, is that club? Well, yeah, I mean, I nearly signed for them before I actually eventually went to Leeds United. Um, and of course, everybody is aware of the, 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 the different types of owners that British clubs have. And at the time that I was going to sign for them, I actually signed my contract and then the ownership changed exchange from one particular people to to another set so my contract become null and void so i had to go back to my original club which was crystal palace at the time four months later i did eventually sign under new ownership um leeds united is in my opinion probably one of the top six teams in british football uh, history tradition um is is incredible you guys on the call, you know, of course, you're not as old as me and Laurie. So, you know, you won't... I mean, you're age bracket, does right? <laughs> you won't really remember um, the great Leeds United teams of old. And of course, we know how good they are now in the Premier League. But it's a huge city and it's a one football club city as well. Like in London, there's, I think there's about close to 20 football clubs in London. But for the size of Leeds and how big Yorkshire is, that's the biggest football club in Yorkshire, which is which is incredible. Forty-two thousand people were there on my debut when I my home debut when we played against West Ham, and I scored the winning goal. I didn't score too many goals in my career, but I scored the winning goal that day against West Ham in front of all that many people. And it's a a brilliant, huge football club with with, with brilliant traditions. Fantastic place. Great, thanks, mate. Um, and the last question I'm going to ask you is: I know that you were captain for a number of, uh, well, I guess a number of teams. Um, was that were you always a captain? Were you always a leader on the field? Is it something you found natural, or was it something that somebody else instilled into you? That's a brilliant question. Of course, you know what's leadership and what 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 does it take to be a captain? Um, I think captains can lead in. A multitude of ways. I think, you know, my type of captain was very much the way that I um, approached the game, the honesty and the commitment that I would play with, but also the demands that I would make of others. Um, and the confidence that I had to speak to people resonated throughout the football club, which is why they, generally the managers did pick me. I've all also played under a different type of captain one that doesn't say an awful lot in the dressing room, but leads by his performances every single week on the pitch. Um, very consistent. And, and I've even had a captain that's a complete maverick in a football club. A, a particular person, Adele Tarat, who I played with at QPR, was the captain. Very different to me, 
very different to some of the other captains, but he was the best player. So he got the armband. And um, I think a captain is a very interesting role to, to, to be given in, in, in a football club. Yeah, and a great honour as well, of course. Huge honour, yeah, of course. Um, so we'll kind of work on the transition now to management. Did you always know that you were going to go into coaching? Uh, was it a smooth transition? Um, is it something you didn't want and, some, you know, which happens often? Do you stumble into it? What was the kind of career path for you with that? I never, th I never th thought about management up until I was about 31, 32 years old. I was loving my career. Um, you think you're going to play forever. And then suddenly at Leeds United, I had a, a terrible injury where um, I had a problem. I got a big kick on my, on, on my heel against Barnsley playing away. And the heel um, ballooned, kind of like calcified all the blood and it turned into, it turned into um, bone. So I had four operations whilst at Leeds. And I, I missed a year of my career through these, um, these operations. And whilst I was sat there on the sideline and I was kind of watching, thinking this probably could be the end of my career. Thankfully, it wasn't. But I was thinking at 31 years old, this is, this is the end of it, really. You know, this is, this is the end of my career. I thought about how much I loved the game. And if I couldn't play, the second best thing would be, would be to stay in the game as either a coach or as a manager. Thankfully, I got my career back on track. A lot of luck with my injuries, played another five years. But gradually from 30, 31 years onwards, I took my coaching badges. Um, so whilst I was still playing, started on my level B, took it to level A, and then only recently have completed a, a pro license and a, and a management diploma, which allows me now to manage and coach at the highest level, which it's took some time. It's took some, a lot of years, probably best part of 10, 11 years to get on my badges. But now gives me that opportunity of hopefully managing now for a number of years going forward. Brilliant. Um, so I know you've had uh, experiences at lower league as well as management with Notts County. Again, as you mentioned, something close to your heart and, and Cambridge. Um, obviously, now you're back in at the Premier League, uh, a club that's very close to your heart as well, at Crystal Palace. What's that experience like being back in the Premier League as a coach, you know, as a first team coach, um, working with Patrick Vieira, obviously, and, and what's that experience like for you now? Well, it's incredible. You know, the, the badge that I've got on my chest at the minute is the, is the crest of Crystal Palace. And it's a, it's a badge that means an awful lot to me because I've obviously played for the club um, over two spells. And I came back as the under 23 academy coach. Um, had two great years as, a, as an academy coach. And then Patrick arrived in the summer. And um, he arrived, and because of this situation with COVID at the minute, he arrived lacking a couple of his um, coaches that he'd already worked with prior to coming to Palace at Nice. So I joined his, um, I joined his team for pre-season, spent six weeks with him, and kind of he got to know me, and I got, I got to know him, and a little, little bit of trust takes place, and, you know, you, you build relationships with these people, and Patrick's been brilliant for me, given me a great opportunity. Um, but to work with top players every day is, um, is what it's all about for me. For the elite, to work with the elite in an elite environment, and especially when it comes to match day. Match day is um, a brilliant, brilliant day for me. It, it, it reminds me of when I was playing, you know, it, that hunger, the fire that's inside me is something that develops on a, on a match day particularly. But working week in, week out and hopefully allowing these players to um, become better um, with, with the coaching that we're putting on at Crystal Palace is a, is a very rewarding job for me. Great. Um, I'll, in a minute, we'll open this question, but I want to finish it with the managing thing. For those that don't know, your last um, Premier League game, I believe it was your last Premier League game, you had a pretty small victory against a relatively unknown team. Is that correct? So for those that don't know, they uh, Crystal Palace's last result, they beat Manchester City and Pep Guardiola 2-0. Um, my last kind of question for you before we open it up is, what is that whole week like? So, you know, well, first of all, what's that experience like? What's the day like? But then what is it like building up to that? What is the work that goes into that, playing 
a lot of the boys and girls in here can relate to Man City. They, they watch them on a regular basis. So how do you start on a Monday ready for that game? Great question. Of course, leading into every Premier League opposition, you need to have a game plan um, and you need to be very, um, very efficient with how you can affect that game plan. But as you know, sometimes game plans don't go to plan because that's the way of the, the way of the game. We led into Manchester City knowing that they were always going to be a team that probably took between 65 and 70 percent of possession and used it very efficiently, especially in the final third. So we knew leading into Manchester City playing away that we we're only going to be in possession for roughly 30, 35 percent of the day. So how could we use our possession effectively? Well, we knew that we looked at all the um, opposition's goals against over the last probably six months. And we knew that in transition, when the ball handed over to us, we needed certain types of players in wide areas where we could isolate the opposition. Thankfully, that really worked for the two goals that we scored. It was um, in transition when we won the ball. Um, but we also knew we had to defend really, really narrowly. So what we tried to do is we tried to narrow the pitch. And if we were going to give up any space, it was going to be on the outside of that narrow pitch. So all our units, we brought tighter, closer together. We brought our wide players really tight as well, craved it and, uh, and congested the, the pitch, tried to play the pitch within a 60 by 40 yards with a little bit of luck some good refereeing decisions as well. We managed to get the win and, and it was a remarkable feeling. Fantastic. Pep wasn't happy, by the way. But So, yeah, sense. I guess that's the last part of that question. What, um, you know, what was he like? What's he like as a character? Because I guess that's the first time you come up with him as, against him as a, as a coach, possibly. Um, what was that day like for you? You know, when you see Pep, is it, you know, not saying you get starstruck, but we all would look and think, that's, that's Pep Guardiola. What's, you know, how was that for you? Yeah, I mean... He was so close, you know, the two benches are very close at the, at the Etihad. And to see somebody who you've watched, not just at Manchester City, but at Bayern Munich, at Barcelona, you know, a, a legend of, of a manager, incredible. Won, won everything that he could possibly want to win. You know, you look and sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you look across and you think, should I really be sharing this particular moment with somebody as, as high as that? But then you've got to back yourself and then you've got to think, well, you know, the story of the underdog and sometimes the underdog does come out winning. And it's like, even if you were playing, you're playing against the top teams in the division and you're perhaps at one of the lower teams. Sometimes the lower team can be at the top team. And that's the case for management and staff. Sometimes you can go up against the Pep Guardiola's or the, the Jurgen Klopp's or, you know, you, you mentioned some of the other managers in the Premier League and you've got to back yourself and you've got to have confidence in your ability, you've got to have confidence in the way that you, you approach the game. And we did, and we knew that we were effective in the way that we could take the game to the opposition. And But to look across is, um, is, is great, especially when you're winning 2-0. <laughs> I bet, mate. And very final question, what advice do you give to all your young players now at Palace? So when you're, obviously you were working with 23s and um, prior to this, you know, what's the biggest, and most important message that you can, I guess, get, give to our players today? Well, if you, you know, the, the boys and girls on this call, if, you know, if, if, if you like me and, and you like Laurie, when we played, we loved the game. It's the best game in the world, in my opinion. I, I, the joys I had from playing the game, and it wasn't so much the the money or, or, or the fame or the adulation, it was the game that I loved. I loved being out on that pitch, being part of a team, up against another team and hoping that we can come out victorious. That's what I loved. So that my advice to the young players and to, uh, and to the boys and girls on this call is fall in love with the game and, uh, and respect the game because the game is the best game in the world. And the more you fall in love with it and you respect it, the more you want to give back to the game. And the more you can give back to the game, the more it will give you. And that means that you might get the financial rewards further down the line. You might get the adulation. But to start with where you guys are now, 
you've got to enjoy it and you've got to go there and you've got to smile and you've got to listen to your coaches and you've got to listen to the people who like Laurie and like the coaches that are working with you whenever you get to see them is they've got brilliant experiences, top level experiences. And you must always listen to good advice because sometimes, sometimes certain people don't listen to the advice and they're the ones that unfortunately fall off the edge of the cliff and they're the ones that kind of like fall out of love with the game. So that would be the one big of advice to me is fall in love with it and listen to your coaches. Just to end that, guys, just to make it absolutely clear, Sean has never pushed anybody off a cliff. All right? <laughs> just want to end that cliff. Um, thanks, mate. That's great advice. Um, so we're going to open up to questions, guys. Um, I'm aware we've got a few people on the call. If anybody wants to start us off, please put your either your hand up or put a... Oh, Aubrey started us off already, so let's go to Aubrey. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself, Aubrey. Uh, what influenced or who influenced you to become a captain? Aubrey, brilliant question. Thanks so much. It's, um, it, it's lovely to meet you guys. Um, my influence was, and you might see him, you might see him on the, um, on, the t on the TVs now when, especially when Manchester United are playing. The old captain there was a, was a captain called Roy Keane. And now he's um, like an analyst. He always talks about the game after, but he was like the, the leader, he was, he was your stereotypical, real fierce leader. And, he, and what he did, um, he came over from Ireland and he played for a team in Nottingham where I lived. He played for Nottingham Forest. So I went to watch him every other week when he was playing at home. And then he went to Manchester United and played for one of the biggest clubs in the world. And he was just the best leader. For me, he was a wonderful, wonderful leader. And even now, whenever he talks, I still listen. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and Aubrey, just about that, you, I'm sure you do see him, but he is, you know, very opinionated, but a very, you know, his standards are exceptionally high, aren't they? Um, his very, standards very... are, his standards are the highest I've probably ever come across in, in, in the game. And a lot of people can't handle his standards. Um, but in the time that he played at Manchester United with the players that he had, and the leadership qualities that he gave his team, that's why they won everything. Great. Thanks, Aubrey. Um, we're going to go to Jackson. Do you want to unmute yourself, buddy? What is it like to coach Zaha? <laughs> Jackson, what a great question. It's difficult some days, let me tell you, because um, Wilfred is a, is a kind of guy who's, um, I think I mentioned the word, um, he, he, a, a maverick type of player. And sometimes when you're coaching the Mavericks, you don't want to coach the game out of them because they're so individualistic. And he is such a character, both on and off the pitch. His characteristics on the pitch, he wants to get the ball. He wants to just beat four or five players and bend it in the top corner. And he's so exciting to watch. But sometimes he actually makes some pretty poor decisions. And sometimes you get a little bit carried away with, you want to tell him the, the right decisions to make. But then you, you, you can't coach that out of a player because he's so good on his day. And I actually played with Wilfred when he, when he made his debut for Crystal Palace as a 16-year-old young player. I was one of the players on the pitch when he played. So I've not only played with him, but now to coach him is a, is a great feeling. He's a great guy and one of the best players in the Premier League, in my opinion. Awesome. Thanks, Jackson. Uh, let's go to just purely because... I think he's got the shirt on. Just because you beat him 2-0, let's go to Colton next. Who's your favourite player to coach? <laughs> well, we've just mentioned one there. Um, but I think the best up to now, I mean, I'm hopeful that I can go and coach a lot more um, top players going forward. But when I was a manager at Notts County, um, I was really, really fortunate, very privileged to coach Jack Grealish. Um, mm. Jack came over and um, he, we signed him on loan from Aston Villa. Fantastic. He was only 17. It's a very young player. And we was fighting in relegation. We could have gone down. But we had this young player who was super good. He really was. He was incredible. And he was, every single day, he was the best player. 
and he just played with the biggest smile on his face. And he actually kept us in the league as a 17-year-old boy. So I would say Jack Grealish is the best young player that I've coached. And when we played Manchester City two weeks ago, uh, I, I, I spoke to him before and after the game. He was a lot happier before than he was af after, but it was still good to see him. I bet he was. Uh, thanks, Colin. Uh, Max? Uh, hi. So, what would you... What did you eat before a game? What a good question, Max. What a great question. Because as, as you will know, you know, diet's so important for um, any athlete, whether that's football or any sport across the board, you know. Your body's like a supercar. It's like a race car. And you've got to be careful what you put in it. You know, so if I'm a race car and I go and put diesel in a petrol, it's not going to work properly, is it? It's as simple as that. So when I was playing, you know, I used to look after my body, drink loads and loads of water, probably about three to four liters a day. Um, you know, I would always be have a, have a drink of water at my hand. I've got one now, even habits now as a 43 year old with the water next to me. But drink good, good liquids. I would always um, eat chicken and pasta and rice, good light carbohydrates. But on a, on a day of a game, my diet was really simple. And uh, I would have baked beans, toast, match day food. And that's what, that's what, was, that's what I had. Brilliant. Thanks, Max. Thank you. The, the, the baked beans have been lost uh, over here, obviously. Definitely a... Of course, yeah. yeah. Stable uh, diet over here, guys. Yeah. I've got to turn the camera around. Jack, I'm coming to you in a second, but... Uh, Kirsty's got a question, so I'm going to move the... What? Camera. No, I do. I do, actually. Um, hi. Hi, um, Obviously, as an aspiring coach manager, um, do you have any advice? And what did you do early on in your career? Because obviously, I'm just starting out. Did you go and get mentored by different coaches? Who did you watch? What did you do? Brilliant. Great question, Kirsty. Absolutely. Um, because of, obviously playing under loads and loads of managers. I think I played over under over 20 managers in my career. Yeah. I had little notebooks and I just, every session that I liked, I would write it down. Mm -hmm. And I'd write it down in a way that we all feel that we can improve a session. So mm -hmm. I would write the session down. And if there was any improvements that I felt I could implement into that session, I would just put a little note to the side, improvements to be made might make the dimensions bigger of, uh, uh, you know, where, you, where, you, where you're training, or I might add another kind of like a little bounce player in there to, to make it a little bit, the flow might be better, or I might, you know, I probably thought, well, it was a great session, but it went on for too long. So I minimalized the minutes. So they were the kind of notes I was making as a player. Mm -hmm. And then when I started to really focus on management and coaching, I went to visit people and I went to spend two, three, four days in their company and not just what they'd done on the grass, but one, they, how they built relationships with people off it, mm -hmm. you know, and everyone's different, aren't we? You know, the way that you would speak to your players, it'll be different to the way that I would speak to mine. Yeah. And, and I'll learn something off you and you'll you learn something off me. Yeah. And that's how the game works, really. It's just kind of like... Go and, ask me, go, go and ask loads of questions. Go and ask a different coach if you can spend the day with, you know, with that particular coach because I guarantee you're going to learn something. You, we all learn something every day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you're welcome. You. See you guys. Thanks, buddy. Um, for the boys that don't know, we have Kirsty Lynette uh, was with Liverpool Ladies last season. So she's over working with the girls over the next 10 days. So a lot of you, uh, if you haven't seen them today, we'll see them. But we'll see you, sorry. Um, I will add to that part. Um, Sean, for those that don't know, Sean has a, um, I won't give the full address out, but Sean has a place in Sarasota. So now that the travel is, uh, or regularly frequents uh, Sarasota at the very least. Um, so when travel opens up and the season's uh, over, I'm sure it'll be a conversation, but um, we'll get you out, Sean, and... Uh, Come and see the, uh, come yeah. the guys in person. Um, Jack, I know you had your hand up. You've been very patient. Hi. Um, I was just 
wondering if you played the same position every for, throughout your whole career. Jack, again, some great questions this evening. There really is. I mean, I am a midfielder. Well, I'm not a very good one now, so I'm, a, I'm an old midfielder. But when I played, I was a midfielder, a holding midfielder, and played right defensive. So, so I was never really one who kind of went up the field and scored the goals. But I actually made my debut as a right back. Um, and this is some opportunity. Opportunity comes at many moments in your career and you've got to grab it with both hands. And even though I'd played as a midfielder all the way from 10 to 18, I made my debut as a right back in the, in the football league. And I played the first, I think, 25 games of my career as a right back. And that was a, you know, something that I, I'd never trained there, but I needed to make my state, state my way in, in the game. So midfield was taken. They were good players, senior players, but there was this one opening for me and I needed to grab it, so it was right back for me. Thank you. you Thanks, Jack, good question. Um, I think Ian was next. Do you want to unmute yourself, Ian? Uh, yeah, so what qualities do they look for in Premier League players? As a Premier League scout, what qualities do they look for? Well, each game, each team will have a different profile of players. Um, so let's take two teams, for example. OK, so we can go a team right at the top of the Premier League, Liverpool. Liverpool have this attacking way of playing really on the front foot and their front three, Mane, Salah, Firmino, they'll all have different qualities that Jurgen Klopp would have probably had at previous club, Borussia Dortmund. So he would always have a profile of a player. And let's take a different team, say Norwich, for example, who have just come up from the championship, who are struggling in the Premier League at this moment in time, but they would have a different type of recruitment. They would have young players coming through their academy, trying to make the grade as a Premier League footballer, and they will be looking at probably bouncing between the Premier League and the Championship over the next three or four years. So there's different types of profile players. My particular profile, in terms of the way that we work at, at Crystal Palace, we've now got a player profile where we've tried to lower the age. We've tried to um, increase goals in the in the starting 11 so now we're starting to score a little bit more a few more goals than we did last year with a different manager but the big thing for crystal palace is that we're developing our own players through the academy and we've got to try and bring as many of them players through to the first team as we possibly can thanks mate good question in thank you i'm gonna just miguel i'm coming to you in a second i'm just going to ask um, a question because dilo's battery is going so he's asked um what about, let's work, I'm just breaking this down, sorry. Um, basically working out um, away from the game. So away from training, that kind of thing, in the gym, that kind of thing. Is that a big part of the game still? And you know, was it for you? Well, yeah, I mean, now Premier League footballers or not just Premier League footballers, but professional footballers got great opportunities to... Um, be a physical specimen in terms of the, you know, your size and your shape, the athleticism in, in, in terms of the way that you, you can move around a pitch. Sports science now is huge. Um, it's, it, it's very, it very much leads um, football clubs. Um, so when I played 20 years ago, I probably went into the gym maybe three, probably four times a week. The players now are in the gym before every session and after every session. And it's not just the old fashioned weights and pull up bars and all that. There's actual specific sessions for your position. So maybe a, a defender will work slightly different to a left winger or a right winger because of the way in which his body works or a body works. So there's many ways now of different programs where professional footballers will be, in, but they'll be in the gym every single day. Thanks, mate. That's great. Um, Delio, I hope you got that before your phone went, buddy. 
Um, Miguel, go for it, mate. Uh, thank you. How are you doing, Laurie? How are you doing, Sean? Hi, you? Um, Hi Miguel. Hey, then. Uh, my question is, what was the like best team you ever played against and your like, favorite memory playing against the team when you in your whole career? Well, I think for me, you know, the, 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 the moments playing in the Premier League against the top teams were the best ones, you know. So I played for QPR in the Premier League. We stayed up in the first game. We, we, so we stayed up in the first um, season. Unfortunately, we um, got relegated out of the Premier League in the second season. But the final day of the first season was QPR played away at Manchester City when Manchester City won the league in the last minute, in the 94th minute, when Aguero scored the winner in the 94th minute. And I'm sure many people on this call will, you know, even, even know you guys are young. Back then, it's still a, a real historic moment in the Premier League. And that was probably the biggest game in the Premier League history. And I actually played in it, which was great. That's amazing. I didn't know that, mate. But for those who know, I know we've got a lot of uh, Man United fans on here. So if you haven't, if you didn't know that or you haven't seen that, it's well worth a look. Uh, good question, Miguel. Thank you, buddy. Um, Owen. Uh, hi. hi mate. How did you stand out at youth level? I think I was a good player, Owen. You know, I was a good player, but, but I wasn't the best player in the team. There was better players than me, probably technically they were better than me. Um, but I had a heart and I had a desire and I had um, a real keenness to try and win every single battle that I had on the football pitch. But I mentioned earlier on, I listened to good advice and I tried to implement that advice onto the pitch. And I would like to think that I had a good attitude, an attitude to work hard every time I went onto the field. Every time I was off the field, you know, the, the behaviours that I had as a, as a young athlete, I think the managers and the coaches appreciated them behaviours. So when you've got that and, and you throw it all into the mix, comes a word of trust. And when the coaches have got trust and they feel that you are reliable as a, as a, as a young boy, as a young girl, as a, as a young player, you get opportunities. And that's what I was. I was a, was a good young player, but I was trustworthy. And that's, was, that they were my, I suppose, characteristics as a young player. Thanks, mate. Good question, Owen. Um, I'm just going to ask one more question with Asha in a second, Asha. I've run through a couple of quick fire questions on here, and I'm just conscious of your time, Desa. So I know it's nearly half 12 there. So, um, Asha, go for it, buddy. I was wondering if it's like a different experience, whichever state in different stadiums that you travel to as like a coach or a player, and which has been your favorite so far? Uh, what a great question. Well, traveling as a player was brilliant because at the end of it, you got to play 90 minutes at all these great stadiums. Um, so to play at Old Trafford, Manchester United, the Etihad for Manchester City. But one particular stadium that I absolutely loved playing at was, was Liverpool. Um, and, the, and the historic song, You'll Never Walk Alone. When you walk out onto, the, uh, onto Liverpool, 45, 50,000 people with the scarves singing You'll Never Walk Alone actually brought tears to my eyes, even though I wasn't a Liverpool player because it was it's such a historic song in, in British football. But I got as much enjoyment taking my team, you know, Notts County and Cambridge to some of the lower level clubs. People think about football and think about the Manchester United and the Liverpools, the Arsenal's, the Man City's, but the pyramid of football is huge. So the smaller teams, you know, you get some brilliant, brilliant days of playing away at different stadiums there as well. Thank you. Good question, Asha. So we'll just finish off, guys, with a couple of quick fire questions on the chat. So we've got from um, 
So, Jay Nielsen, um, how do you respond to losing in a big game? Losing's horrible, yeah. but it's part of the game. <laughs> yeah. And we have to get to... We, every, the best players in the world lose. So I think what you've got to do is you've got to take the hurt and you've got to control your emotions. And I think, you know, if I've seen some young players throw hissy fits and throw their arms around and curse the coach and curse the parent and curse the player. That isn't the way, guys. We're a team. We are a part of a, a, a big unit who will win together, we'll lose together, we'll draw together. But ultimately, we are a team. And the team is the most important part of being involved in, in, in football for me. I hated losing every single time. I, I hated it. But the good thing about football, there's always another opportunity around the corner. Thanks, mate. Um, and I think that answers your question as well, Leila. And just the last couple on here, mate. One from Ronan. Um, does Vieira bring the invincible... Laurie, one minute. Let me just turn yeah. the TV off. For some reason, it's come back on. <laughs> just watching a football documentary. Oh, 12, oh. there you go. Uh, does Vieira bring the invincible mentality to the dressing room? Oh. Well, that's why he's here. I mean, yeah. he's, he's at Crystal Palace for, for them types of characteristics, for them values. Um, he does. Interesting. When we beat Manchester City the other week, in past years, I've been told when Crystal Palace went and beat the bigger clubs, it was, so, it was such a joyous occasion. Everyone's really happy and kind of thinking, oh, we can't believe this. But the first thing he said when he got everybody in the dressing room afterwards, we've got to make sure that we win our next game. So it was kind of like bringing everyone back down to earth again. And he didn't want them to get too um, carried away with the result because he was used to winning, wasn't he? You know, the invincible of 38 unbeaten throughout that season. I'm not too sure that will ever be seen again in the Premier League. But he's got them values and he's got them that characteristic of making sure all our players are level and it keeps you on that level, which is a real high level, by the way. Brilliant. Thanks, mate. And the last question we have um, is from Todd. I'm just going to add a little bit, combine two questions. How many hours do you spend uh, or do players spend studying compared to how much they practice with a ball? And is it different for different positions? And adding to that is... Um, what is the importance of rest compared to just training? Well, we can't spend 24 hours a day on a pitch, can we? Because, you know, we'll be, we'll, we'll be shattered. You know, we'll, we'll run out of energy and it'll be a nightmare the next day. So you've got to be very careful how many hours you spend. Um, I think we probably spend two hours a day just on the grass. But that's not to say that you can't continue to learn. So... I think in our football club, we must have over 10, maybe 12 analysts. So they'll all be, um, some will work on the, uh, on the big picture, which is the next opponent, the next game. And some will work individual. So we'll have analysts for defenders, midfielders, attackers. We work with our players and we break the game down and we, 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 we speak to the analyst and we have loads and loads of video um, video conversations mainly in the afternoon and when we work together as a group either in our units or in our uh, individual work we can probably spend maybe two hours a day as well um, trying to get better from, from the um, from the analyst Brilliant. thanks mate um, I think that's it from us guys um, there's a, honestly thanks we appreciate it. it's half 12 in the morning there we really do appreciate it. We'll hopefully get you out next time you're over here in the summer. We'll get you out to do some sessions and meet the guys in person. But thanks for the questions, guys. Thanks for your time, Deza. I'll, um, I'm Brilliant, guys. You. Take care. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.